Welcome to Vintage Church. If I've never met you before, my name is Dustin Turner. I serve as the lead pastor of Vintage Church. If you would stand with me and open up your copy of God's Word to Exodus chapter 13. If you need a copy of God's Word, lift up your hand, whether that's in English or Spanish, and we will get you a copy. But we are at Exodus chapter 13, and those words will be on the screen as well. Here is what the Lord says. The Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me all of the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and beast is mine. Then Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand, the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten today in the month of Abib, you are going out. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days, no leavened bread shall be seen with you. And no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes. And the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statute at its appointed time from year to year. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem, and when in time to come your son asks you, what does this mean, you shall say to him, by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes, for by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. We kicked back off starting last week this series that we call Crossover, looking at the book of Exodus. And if you are new or you're looking for resources, you want to catch up, there is a link that's going to be on the screen. You can find everything there, my sermon notes, v-group studies, uh, sermon audio, sermon video, as well as an introduction to the book of Exodus. So if you're new to the book of Exodus, or you're wanting to know more about that book or more about the scriptures, that is a great resource for you. Again, all of that is right there on that link. What we started with last week was the people of Israel coming out of the land, literally the Exodus, where the people are coming out of the land, going toward the promised land. And really what I want you to understand about last week, about today, really a lot of what the Lord is telling the people of Israel is the power of story. How many of you love a good story? Whether it is fiction, whether it's a historical story, whether it's a personal story, stories are powerful. Stories can challenge us. Stories can inspire us. Stories can help us remember. There's a story that I share often now with my kids, and it has to do with this coffee can. I have no idea how old this coffee can is, but this was my great-grandmother's. We called her Granny Dude, and uh, she lived to be about 83, 84 before she passed away, and inside this can are checkers. And when my great-grandmother passed away, there were a few things in her house as we were going through everything that I knew that I wanted. And one of those things that I knew that I wanted was her checkers and her checkerboard. 
And the reason that I wanted it is because I remember vividly playing checkers with her as a boy. I mean, even as a teenager, I would sit down and play checkers with her, and believe it or not, she never, ever let me win. (laughs) Not once did I beat my great-grandmother in checkers. And so when she died, I got her checkerboard, I got her checkers, I mean, it's like handmade, this board, and there's like initials chiseled in on it. And so recently, my kids, Gabe, my son is 10, and my daughter, Emily, who is 7, they've gotten this, these checkers and this checkerboard out, and they've started to play with these checkers. And when I see this coffee can, and when I see that checkerboard, I immediately remember my great-grandmother. And in that moment of remembering her and having those memories, it's a reminder for me to then tell stories about her to my kids, my kids who are her great, great grandchildren. That is the power of a story. And that's exactly what the Lord tells the people of Israel to do in Exodus chapter 13, to use story to be reminded of, to remember who the Lord is and what the Lord has done. Two important points today, if you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, remember, everybody say remember. Remember what the Lord has done by showing. Everybody say showing. Remember what the Lord has done by showing. There are two things from Exodus 13 that the people of Israel are to do. The first is about the consecration of the firstborn. Go back and look at verses 11 through 13. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. Now, there's some interesting things in there, right? This week, as I was sharing this text with our team, I read that passage about the breaking of the donkey's neck, and Pastor Weaver was just shocked. Like, what in the world is happening, right? you got to understand what's going on. In the ancient world, the donkey was a working animal. And so part of what's happening in this passage is the Lord is challenging them to think back, to look back to how God redeemed their firstborn. If you remember, the tenth sign, the tenth plague, it was the Passover when the the Lord passed over the houses with the Passover lamb's blood on it. But if you didn't have the blood of the Passover lamb, you were killed. The firstborn was killed. And so in this passage, as God talks about this, says, listen, every firstborn animal, you are to sacrifice to me, unless it's a donkey. And you can sacrifice the lamb in place of that because you're going to use that donkey for work. And every firstborn male is to be not sacrificed, but redeemed. Why? Because God redeemed the firstborn of Israel. All of this was set aside to help them remember. And in the midst of remembering, that they would believe that the first and the best always belong to God. That's why the tenth sign, the tenth plague, was such a big deal. It wasn't just that someone or something was dying, it was that the first and the best was being killed. The firstborn male was the heir to everything, whether it was that person who was the prince of Egypt or whether it was just the firstborn male in a family, they were the heir. And so God is saying, listen, I am going to, just like I did then, redeem the firstborn every time a firstborn is born among you. So there's the consecration of the firstborn, but they're also supposed to practice the feast of unleavened bread. Look at verses 6 through 7. 
In verses 6 through 7 of Exodus 13, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in all of your territory. So the feast of unleavened bread was again all about God's deliverance. The feast of unleavened bread was literally a seven day party. Just Side note, in the Old Testament, God knew how to party, right? Seven days of feasting, right? The the whole thing begins with the Passover feast. You take the Passover lamb, you take it to the temple, it is slaughtered, and unlike every other sacrifice, they give the lamb back to you, you take it, and you cook it, you boil it. I'm sorry, you, you cook it over fire, Then they were to take bitter herbs. They eat the bitter herbs with the Passover meal because the bitter herbs symbolized their slavery. And they were to eat then unleavened bread. Why? Because leaven takes time to rise. And there was no time to wait for the bread to rise. So they made unleavened bread to eat the meal. So the Passover meal kicked off this entire week-long feast to celebrate and to remember what God had done for them. And then the party ended after the seventh day. The point, again, of all of this was that God's redemption from slavery was to be remembered. That God wanted the people of Israel to remember what He had done for them. Now, all of this was to help the Israelites remember. So the follow-up question for you and I is then what are we to do? What's our responsibility? Well, I think it's very similar in that what we are to do are the habits that remind us of who God is and what He has done. We might not celebrate the consecration of the firstborn. We might not celebrate the Passover. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But we can cultivate in our lives, both individually as well as corporately, habits that remind us or help us remember who God is and what He's done for us. It's really about the power of habit, or we don't like to use this word so much, the power of ritual. A lot of people have an issue with habits or rituals because when we think about those things, we think about how they become rote and they become stale and then we just do them and we forget why we're doing them. But there is power in habit. There is power in ritual. One commentator says this, what is repeated becomes familiar and this becomes a part of us. Just because a habit or a ritual can become rote and stale doesn't mean it doesn't have power. Think about corporate worship. Think about everything that we do here on a weekly basis. Every week we gather together and with small variations... We practically do the same thing every week. I hope you you realize that. That when we walk in, you might get coffee, you might use the restroom, you come in, you're probably greeted, you greet other people, you sit down, Pastor Mark calls us to worship, you stand up, you sing some songs, you're welcomed, we sing some more songs, we read the scriptures together, you hear a word from me or one of the other pastors, we serve one another We respond through singing, we respond through taking communion, we celebrate baptism, we respond through generosity, through giving, we stand up, there's a benediction, may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, the fellowship of the Spirit be with you, may God empower us to live the gospel, serve the city, and be the church every single week. Now, the danger in all of that, right, is you begin to walk and go through the motions. And you're like, well, this is just what we do every week. Nothing needs to change and everything is fine. But the power in that is that week in and week out, you are reminded of what? Who God is and what He's done. One pastor and scholar says this. He says, in my experience, going to church on a given Sunday doesn't often help. But listen to what he says next. 
But going to church for many Sundays during a dark year does. It's amazing what God can do when we build in a habit or ritual and we practice it on a daily or weekly or yearly basis. That's what God was doing with the people of Israel. And that's what he's done, not just with us with corporate worship, but with communion. The Passover meal that the people of Israel were called to partake in, Jesus takes and reorients the whole meal around not the first exodus, redemption from physical slavery, but the second exodus, redemption from spiritual slavery. And Jesus takes that meal when he's in the upper room having that last supper with his disciples. Almost every scholar will tell you that that was a Passover meal. There was wine there. There was bread there. They have the elements. And what Jesus does is he reorients those elements to say, listen, the unleavened bread is not just about the fact that we had to get out of slavery quickly. The wine is not just this part of the meal. This actually means something more. And he reorients and says, this bread, and he breaks the bread. He says, this is my body. It's broken for you. And he takes the cup of wine. And he says, this wine is my blood poured out for you. Paul tells us that we're to do this in remembrance of him. And quickly in the early church, this becomes something that is practiced on a weekly basis. To do what? To remember. So when we take communion together, we talk about this every time that we take communion. We do several things. Number one, we thank God for both His common and saving grace. His common grace in that the bread and the juice come from whom? Him. His saving grace in that it's because of Him that the bread represents the body. It's because of Him that the blood rep- or the juice represents His blood. And it's in that that we have salvation. Number two, we remember the death of Jesus on the cross for our sins. That Jesus went to the cross and died on our behalf. Number three, when we take communion, we draw near to Jesus by the Holy Spirit. As he draws near to us, it is a spiritual moment. The bread and the juice mean something. Number four, just as we draw near to Jesus in the same way, we maintain the unity of our church by drawing near to one another. Paul in 1 Corinthians talks about a common loaf. In the early church, they would have had communion with one piece of bread, one loaf. And that symbolized the unity together, it meant something. And lastly, Jesus himself said this, that we anticipate Jesus' return and coming kingdom. Every time we take communion, we remember that a day is coming in the future when we will sit down with Jesus and we will feast in his kingdom. So just as the Jews were told to celebrate Passover and remember what God had done, Jesus tweaks it and changes everything, reorients it to say, listen, every time you take communion, remember this, remember me, remember these things. Remember the gospel. When you take communion, remember that Jesus came to earth. He is God, came to earth, put on flesh, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for your sins, rose from the grave for you, and that that gospel requires a response. Repentance, turning away from the way you have been living, In faith, turning to trust in Jesus, his death and his resurrection, and confessing that faith through baptism, being buried with Jesus. Again, another act that remembers being buried with Jesus, dying with Jesus, coming up out of the water, rising with Jesus. These things mean something. I shared this the first time that we preached part of Exodus, and it's still true in this section, what is not carefully and intentionally remembered is easily and naturally forgotten. What is not carefully and intentionally remembered is easily and naturally 
forgotten. Which is why we do something. We show something. So we're called to remember what the Lord has done by showing, number two, we remember what the Lord has done by telling. Everybody say remember. Remember what the Lord has done by, say, telling. Telling. Now, before we jump into what I mean by this, let me give you an illustration. We all know what this is, right? Do you know what this is? If I pull this apart, do you know what that is? That's Velcro. Now, here's the thing. The power of story has to do with memory. We tell stories to remember things, right? And often when we think about our memory, what we think about, at least what I think about, is like a large storage cabinet or a file cabinet. And I take a memory, I open that file cabinet door. If I remember it, I put it in the file cabinet and I close the file cabinet. And I know that any point in time, if I need to pull out that memory, what do I do? I open that metaphorical file cabinet, pull out that memory, and I remember it. That's not how our memory works. Our memory is more like Velcro. What do I mean by that? I want you to check a look at this picture. As you think about Velcro. Now, if you touch Velcro, you know that there is like a, a, a tough part, right? There's a, a scratchy part. And that is these hooks. The, the, the rough part of Velcro is the hook. The soft part of Velcro are all of these loops. And so the way that Velcro works is the hook finds a loop and it attaches. This is how your memory works. See, these, the loops, are memories. And what you need more of is you need more hooks to connect into the loops, to remember the memories. So anytime you're learning anything, right, it's not just enough to use one sense. It's not just enough to hear. If you touch, if you see, if you taste, if you smell, you've given yourself more hooks to remember. Who God is and what God's done works the same way. We need more hooks. So it's not just about showing. It's also about telling. It's not just about doing It's about saying as well. What were the Israelites to say? Go back and look at verses 8 through 9. Look at this extra hook. God tells them to do something, and then He says, when you're doing this, say this as well. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. Look at what he says. This happens four times in this passage. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. Talking about the Passover. When you celebrate the Passover, when you celebrate the unleavened bread, yes, have the meal. But as you're having the meal, talk about what the meal means. What God did for you to commemorate that meal. Look at verses 14 through 16, talking about the consecration of the firstborn. And when in time to come, your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand, sound familiar? The Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes. What? For by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt." See, God ties together this doing and saying, this showing and telling, that the way in which we remember is we create more hooks. We do and say, we show and tell to connect to those memories of what the Lord has done for us and ultimately who the Lord is. So then for us, what are we to say? In a similar fashion, we are to say the words that remind us of who God is 
and what he's done. We're to say the words that remind us of who God is and what he has done. In Exodus 13, those words remind us of the first Exodus. But we know as we continue to read the biblical story and we learn more about who God is and what God has done for us, is that there's a new Exodus. And this new Exodus is the story of what God has done for us through Jesus, the gospel. So part of what we need to be telling ourselves and telling other people is the gospel. We need to be sharing the gospel with ourselves, preaching the gospel to ourselves to be reminded and remember who God is and what God has done for us. Think about these passages. All of these come from the Apostle Paul. Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15 says this, He is the image of the invisible God. The what? Okay, say it again. The what? The firstborn of creation. Does that sound familiar? Have we been talking about the firstborn? Exodus chapter 13. That God would redeem the firstborn of Israel. And then Paul in Colossians says that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. Not that Jesus was created. If Jesus is God then he is uncreated. Yes, he was born of a woman, but he simply put on flesh. The Son is eternal. The Son has always existed. So when Paul says that he is the firstborn, he's saying that he is the eternal Son of the Father. He's the firstborn. Now look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He, that is the Father, who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all. So what Paul is saying is that the father did not spare his firstborn son. What did God do? What did the father do in Exodus 13? He spared the firstborn sons of Israel by redeeming them with the Passover lamb. But here, Paul is saying, this firstborn son is different. This firstborn son wasn't spared. Why? One more place, Galatians chapter 4 The Apostle Paul again says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His what? His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. To do what? To redeem the very word that's used in the book of Exodus. That word literally means to buy back from slavery. To redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as what? Sons. To redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying what? Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, like the Israelites were, but now a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Do do you see what Paul is doing in just these few places? How he's tying all of what Jesus has done for us back to the first exodus. That God redeemed the people of Israel out of physical slavery. He redeemed these firstborn. The firstborn was for him. And in the same way, God has a firstborn. The Father has a firstborn. His eternal Son. And rather than spare his firstborn son, his eternal son, like he did with the people of Israel, he gave his firstborn. Jesus willingly came and did what? Died on our behalf to redeem us. And then Paul says, in that redemption, when we are saved, the spirit of that son, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, comes into our hearts And when the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts, we become what? Sons. Now, I've shared this passage before and said we're sons and daughters, children of God. But I want you to hold on to the significance of of Paul calling both men and women sons of God. Because what he's getting at in this passage is that to be an heir of a family, you had to be the firstborn male. So what Paul is saying spiritually is whether you are male or female, because of Jesus and the Spirit of God coming into you, all of us 
become firstborn male heirs. Meaning every single blessing that is given to the firstborn becomes what? Ours. And then the Spirit of God on our behalf behalf testifies. We cry out, Abba, Father. He is our Father. He is our Father because the Spirit makes us His children because His Son died on our behalf. Do you see that connection? And do you see what Paul is trying to do in three different letters is remind us this is the gospel that we are to tell ourselves, to remind ourselves of, to teach us and to show us. That is the good news. That is who God is and what God has done on our behalf. So how do we do that? It's where we begin to talk about spiritual habits, the power of Bible reading, the power of Scripture memory. If you're not filling your mind and your heart with God's Word, you're not going to remember it. You have to remember it. It's the power of community. It's why we talk so much about V groups and formation groups, because in those communities, you have other people telling you the truth of the gospel. And in like manner, you have the ability to tell other people about the truth of the gospel. If you are isolated and alone, no one can tell you the gospel, and you can't tell anyone else the gospel. It's the significance of community. And I want to take a moment just to speak to the parents. Because hopefully what you see in this passage, in Exodus chapter 13 is Moses, God, through Moses, telling the people of Israel how important it is for parents to tell their kids so their kids will tell their kids and their kids will tell their kids. And so this will be throughout generations of who God is and what God has done. So just a few tools to help you through this. Number one, just Bible reading and prayer. If you have children, read the Bible with them and pray with them. Let them see, let them hear those stories and let them hear how you talk to God and then give them a chance to do the same. When they get to a point where they can read, let them read. When they get to a point when they can pray out loud, let them pray out loud and just wait till you hear what they say, right? Let them do that. Another tool that we have used in my house is uh, what's called a new city catechism. Catechism is just a way to teach And catechisms are typically arranged and organized around questions and answers. Now, I'm just going to tell you, in the Turner household, we've fallen off the wagon a little bit. We were doing this hardcore, and then we just got busy, and we've not been doing it. But it's powerful to even hear my kids be able to answer these questions. Simple questions like, what's our only hope in life and death? And then you teach your child the answer to that question, that we are not our own, but belong to God. I don't know about you. I need to be reminded of that truth. So as I'm teaching my kids, I'm remembering the power of the truth of the gospel. So you could use that. We also have our parent cue. This is tied to the curriculum that we use back in our V-Kids You can get it in paper, we give those out here, or you can download the app. If you go and you look, Parent Q, you can find the app. By the way, this is an app as well. Just download New City Catechism and you can find it, okay? So I got a a screenshot of the Parent Q app that you'll see. And there's like a video tied to it. There are questions that you can ask it like during, the dry, during your commute with your kids, uh, during bedtime, during mealtime. There are points for you to teach that you can show as well. All of this is, again, connected to what our kids are learning back in V-Kids. Okay? You can see it right here. So this is for my son Gabe. There's a memory verse. There's a short video. There's a, a four-day devotional literally walking them through. Here's the things, morning time, drive time, meal time, bedtime. More activities are available as well. Another resource to help you show and tell your kids who the Lord is 
in what he's done. What is not carefully and intentionally remembered is easily and naturally forgotten. What are you going to do to remember? The question for you and I isn't, are we being formed? Every single one of us are being formed. Our kids are being formed. The question is, how are you being formed? What you do and say forms you, and what you show and tell will form others. So this week, as you go into your week, I want to leave you with two questions to reflect on. Number one, what will you do and say to remember who the Lord is and what He has done? What will you do and say to remember who the Lord is and what He has done? And number two, how will you show and tell others who the Lord is and what He has done? Whether that's your spouse, your kids, your friends, your family, your co-workers, your neighbors, that stranger you meet. We have to remember for ourselves before we can remind others. But the most important truth that we have to cling on to is who the Lord is and what He's done. Remember who the Lord is and remember what He's done. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for who You are and we thank You for what You've done. Help us, God, to remember And help us to not only remind ourselves, but remind those around us who you are and what you've done. Help us now, Father, as we respond to you. We love you and we thank you. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.